Hello again, everyone. Welcome to Washington Gun Law TV. I am Washington Gun Law President William Kirk. Thanks for joining us. Well, unfortunately, we got to talk about it some more. We're going to have to talk more about solvent traps because we've continued to try to have conversations with the ATF to try to figure out what the heck is really going on so that we could advise you on how you can remain lawful and responsible gun owners. So let's spend a few minutes today because the ATF responds sort of on solvent traps. Okay, before we get rolling, you guys know the drill. If you like this video, go ahead and click that like button down below. If you want to stay up to date on issues related to your Second Amendment rights, go ahead and click the subscribe button down below. Click the little bell logo if you want to be notified when we post new videos. And most importantly, let's keep the comments and discussions coming. That's how we're going to make sure that we get our videos out to more lawful and responsible gun owners like yourself. Okay, so this is a, another video in a long series of videos that started back in August when we were talking about these solvent traps and we knew that people were milling them out, converting them to suppressors, and we advised at that time that was not a good idea. Now, recently we've had to do videos about is the ATF really coming after those that purchase solvent traps? And that was based upon the fact that a company named Diversified Machine, who made a lot of these, had been raided. And we know when the ATF raids a company, they're not just going to take the inventory. They're going to take all the sales records. They're going to take all the shipping records. And therefore, many otherwise lawful and responsible gun owners started receiving nasty little letters from the ATF saying, warning, you may be in violation of federal law. Now, I had a lot of people contact me, especially after we did that video, and I decided to reach out to the ATF to try to get some guidance as to what they really meant by this. And as we worked through this issue, we realized that everyone was really kind of falling into one of three categories. They either, A, were individuals who had purchased these solvent traps and then really just never did anything else with them. Maybe they used them as a solvent trap. Maybe they just never used them at all. There was B, some individuals who had purchased these and yes, converted them to suppressors, but never did any of the ATF paperwork. And I candidly really didn't need the ATF to tell me what the problem was there. And then there was this very unique third category of individuals um, that had purchased these solvent traps, but also went through all the appropriate ATF channels when they converted it to a suppressor. They filled out their form one, they paid their $200 tax stamp. They received ATF approval. Now, even these folks were actually receiving the nasty little letter from the ATF. So why was that? So we know we reached out to John Tibbetts, who's the executive counsel for the ATF, happens to be here in Seattle, and we asked them those questions based upon the three categories of individuals that I was encountering. And we did a video where we actually recited verbatim the exact answers as given to us by ATF counsel. And the bottom line is, is the problem really stems from diversified machine. Diversified machine, in this instance, was supposed to get ATF approval to make suppressor components. They did not do so. Therefore, the people who were buying them just as solvent traps were actually buying illegal contraband. Now, the purchaser did not know that, and it appears that the ATF's focus is on diversified machine, not on the purchaser. But yes, they want the parts back. Now, those who purchased this, can, purchased them, converted them, and didn't do the uh, ATF paperwork, candidly, we told you back in August that that was going to be a problem. It remains a problem, and the ATF absolutely certainly wants those back. I think this is the category of individuals that have to be most conscientious about how they're going to be turned in as to avoid any detection in the event that ATF decides to pursue this further. And then the third category of individuals we were told also needed to turn them in. These are the people who actually purchased them, did the Form 1, paid the tax stamp, got approval. Everything was fine. Jumped through every legal hoop there possibly was, and yet they were still being asked to give them back. Why? Well, because what the ATF is saying in their interpretation of what happened is, is that what Diversified Machine was manufacturing and selling us already constituted a completed silencer. It was not a component thereof. It actually was a completed suppressor. And so for that reason, when somebody like the gentleman I'm going to talk about today received it and did his Form 1, he was actually supposed to do a Form 4. So in that situation, they're being told that, yes, the suppressor is going to be stricken from the National Firearms Registry under your particular name. And yes, that part needs to either be surrendered or evidence of its destruction needs to be given to the ATF. Now, the individual I was contacted by, we're going to call him Aaron today. That's not his real name, but Aaron is an otherwise lawful, responsible gun owner 
who way back in 2016 purchased one of these solvent traps from Diversified Machine, did convert it into a suppressor, but went and filled out his Form 1, paid his tax stamp, and actually received ATF approval in 2016. So this suppressor has been in his lawful possession for almost six years at this point. Well, when he contacted me, I already had had the answers for Mr. Tibbetts. I explained to Aaron what was going on and that we, in fact, needed to surrender it. He had no problem with it. He kind of said it was a piece of junk anyways. It didn't really work like it should have, and he had no problem surrendering it. So, problem solved, right? We just contact the ATF, and we'll figure out a way to surrender it. So, this is where the story gets interesting now. So we contact the ATF Seattle field office. And of course, it's about three or four people into the call before I finally get somebody who understands what they're talking about. And I say, hey, I need to talk to somebody who can explain how the surrender can occur, or how can we effectuate this surrender? And I was told that I would be called by the field agent. So what did I get for the next day? That's right, crickets. So I eventually did get a call from an ATF field agent by the last name of Mayo. Now, Mr. Mayo, when I first talked to Mr. Mayo and I explained what was going on with these solvent traps, he had no clue what I was talking about. So I directed him to Mr. Tibbetts and I said, why don't you talk to your executive counsel and he will fill you in on this. And when you understand what we're talking about, you can go ahead and give me a call back. So uh, a day later, after more, we get a call back from Mr. Mayo who says, okay, I understand what's going on. I need you to contact our on-duty duty agent for the week in the Puget Sound region. And he gives me the number. Uh, it's an out-of-state number. And so I call that number. Now, when I called that number, it was very apparent to me that I was probably receiving the voicemail of somebody who was not an ATF agent. Instead, it was a very sweet old lady named Joanne. And although I have not had an opportunity to personally speak to Joanne, I'm, I'm sure she is just as charming as she sounded on her voicemail. The problem was Joanne did not identify herself as an ATF agent. Uh, she candidly didn't sound uh, age appropriate to be an ATF agent. And her voicemail box was full. I reached back to Mr. Mayo and I said, hey, listen, can you double check this number? I think you've gotten, I think you gave me the wrong number, maybe a digits off or something like that. And he assured me with absolute certainty that I had the correct number for the on-duty ATF field agent. Uh, since I wasn't able to leave voicemails with Joanne, I did send several text messages and of course got a few more days of and eventually I was contacted via text message by Joanne who then told me that she had no idea what I was talking about. She wasn't even sure what the ATF is and she absolutely positively was not an agent of the ATF. And candidly, I believed her. I then of course had to reach back to Mr. Mayo again and sent him the following text message. Mr. Mayo, this is attorney William Kirk again. I want you to know that I have attempted to leave voicemails on that number you gave me and it is going to a voicemail for a woman named Joanne who has no space left in her voicemail box. I have also sent a couple of text messages and I'm beginning to wonder whether or not this person is, an, is actually an ATF agent. With all due respect, I have a client who is trying to comply with the law as stated in a letter he received from the ATF and he is getting absolutely nothing but confusion from this agency as how to comply with this. I find it mildly amazing that we are ordered to surrender a part to the ATF and yet cannot find a soul to help us take, take that part from us. Please assist if you can. And the answer I received back was Roger. Now, I again went through another day or two of... And at that point, I sent Mr. Mayo back another message and I said, listen, do I need to contact Mr. Tibbetts or can you get me the name of a duty agent so I can get this taken care of? And today, about an hour and a half ago before I taped this video, I actually received the number for an agent Montana. Okay, now we're getting somewhere, right? So I contacted agent Montana, who when I first talked to him today, very nice gentleman, by the way, said, I have no idea what you're talking about. 
I directed him back to Mr. Mayo and Mr. Tebbets and said, why don't you get up to speed? And then when you are up to speed, let me know. So I did have an opportunity to talk to Agent Montana again. And I will say he's been very responsive compared to the other responses that I've gotten from the ATF. Agent Montana stands out in the crowd here. Um, I had explained to him that my client, Aaron, was a gentleman who had filled out the Form 1 and gone through all the appropriate channels, but was, was still being asked to surrender to this. Agent Montana called me back to inform me that as long as the Form 1 checked out, he would not have to surrender it. I then directed him to Mr. Tibbetts' email, which of course said something quite the contrary. And where we sit today, Wednesday, January 27th at approximately six o'clock in the evening is, Mr. Montana, Agent Montana is trying to get to the bottom of this as to whether or not Aaron actually has to surrender this component. And then if so, how will we do it? Now, if we are allowed to surrender this, or if we're required to surrender this, I should say, how do I plan on doing this? I'm gonna actually have Aaron bring the part here to my office along with a copy of the Form 1. I am not going to give the ATF agent the copy of the Form 1, but I will certainly give him the part. But I will have the agent come here to my office and pick it up at a time when Aaron is not here. Again, I'm not super concerned about ATF going out and raiding individual homes. I think the people who bought one or two of these things didn't do anything with them. If you turn them back in, that's the end of this. Their beef is really with the diversified machine folks. I really strongly believe that those that filled out the Form 1 went through all the appropriate channels. Basically followed the law as you believed it to be at that time, once again, the, the beef that the ATF has is going to be with diversified machine. Now, the group of people, though, that I am concerned about, and you know who you are, are the people who converted these things and didn't do any of the ATF paperwork. That's a problem. And I know there are some individuals out there who may have bought 20, 30, 40 of these things, converted all of them and turned them into stocking stuffers. And I can assure you that if you're one of those individuals and you do not start turning these things in, the ATF does have sales records. They know exactly what you purchased. They know when you purchased it and they could quite possibly come knocking on your door. Listen, there's surely gonna be more developments because as we are beginning to realize, when we deal with the ATF, the goalpost is always moving. And I'm sure it will continue to move in this story and we will continue to keep you updated as things develop. You may have more questions about these solvent traps or anything related to your Second Amendment rights. And if you do, don't ever hesitate to contact us at WashingtonGunLaw.com or of course you can call us directly at 425-765-0487. Now remember, Part of being the lawful and responsible gun owner, like we talk about all the time here at Washington Gun Law, is to know what the law is in every situation and how it applies to you in any instance that you may find yourself. Until next time, thanks for watching. Stay safe.